I've been on seven auditions for my commercials this year. I've been on seven auditions, two callbacks, no avails, no booked. Boo. But uh, in my career, you're probably saying, Chip, how many have you been on your career? Well, I will tell you, through 2017, I've been on 1,879 auditions, 503 callbacks, 175 avails, and 74 bookings. Listening to Inside Acting, a podcast dedicated to demystifying the inner and outer game of success in the entertainment industry. I'm Trevor Alka. And I'm AJ Meyer. And in episode 310, we sit down with Chip Chinnery, a working actor with several dozen co star roles, a nationally known stand up comedian, and the guy behind Chip's Money Tips, a personal finance hacking blog that Every actor should be reading, to be completely honest. In part one of our conversation, Chip tells us about getting started as both a comedian and an actor in Los Angeles, how and why he meticulously tracks every aspect of his career, and a few tricks he's learned booking dozens and dozens of commercials and TV gigs. Stay with us. Support for this episode of Inside Acting is brought to you in part by Rehearsal Pro, the current version of Rehearsal, the essential iOS app for actors. It's available right now inside the iOS app store, so if you want to learn your lines, be off book for your auditions, explore your character, make stronger choices, do a whole bunch more, go to rehearsal.pro slash IAP right now where you can learn all about the super kick-ass new features in this newest version of Rehearsal, the groundbreaking app designed for actors, by actors. You will love it. We love it. Check it out. You won't be sorry. Rehearsal.pro slash IAP. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday (laughs) to you. Happy birthday, dear Trevor, Mr. President. Happy birthday to... Wait, whoa, whoa. Started going a different direction. Uh, happy birthday, buddy! Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. We, um, we did that crossover episode last week, so we didn't really get a chance to mention it. But uh, how was your birthday, my friend? Oh, it was great. It was great. Very relaxing. It was awesome. Had a big pancake breakfast. I spent the day at the Griffith Observatory. I went to Crossroads uh, for dinner. It was amazing. It's really, really great. I feel like if anyone deserves eating a giant stack of pancakes on their birthday it's mr 300 plus workouts a year (laughs) like i imagine that like just goes down so nice Mm -hmm. like yeah these calories don't own me uh yeah you know i mean it's interesting i'm in my ever in my everlasting quest to understand you know human nutrition and psychology uh i've I've learning i'm learning about uh gut flora like gut bacteria and how that influences everything from your mood to your uh, mental clarity to you know how much body fat your body carries and all sorts of stuff and so i'm learning far more about this than i ever thought i would and it's really interesting that that the foods you eat either feed or kill certain bacteria in your gut which then informs all sorts of metabolic processes throughout your body and so it really is just more evidence in the column of eating a whole foods plant-based diet to just thrive and uh when you when you base your diet completely on Things like berries and fruits and whole grains and starches and legumes and veggies, it's it's pretty hard to, to go wrong. So I ate a ton of those pancakes pretty guilt-free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I love that that whole time it was just you building up to the justification for eating tons of these pancakes. <laughs> You're like – I mean, it, it makes scientific sense, but it, but just the way that you delivered it was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Gut well, flora and this and that and science this and science that and I ate a shit ton of pancakes. <laughs> well, it's – it's I just – I'm convinced that there's a diet out there that lets me eat as much as I freaking want and not get fat and I'm trying to find out what that is. And I think I'm getting close. So yeah, man. It was great. It was uh, really good. It's really amen. Good. Amen, brother. It's Yes, it's called the water diet. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, right. Well, we're about it's halfway. The diet. Yeah, yeah, we're about halfway between uh, my birthday and your birthday, which is coming up very shortly. Do you have any big plans for the big day? Um, so for my birthday, like the date of my birthday, I really don't. Um, I have a small thing that I actually um invited you to, but no one looks at Facebook invites. I just did that to kind of put all the information in one place. So you are invited, my friend, oh. on the day of my birthday, but um. My, so my birthday happens and then four days later, Jasmine's mom's birthday happens. And then four days later, my mom's birthday happens. Wow. And so, yeah, so they're, they're all like about eight days apart <clears throat> and my mom and Jasmine's mom both turn the big six O this year. So as a way of sort of celebrating Everyone is going up to Jasmine's mom's flying in from Australia, and then everyone is driving up to Lake Tahoe. And we're going to be in Lake Tahoe for a week. And then I get to take, well, Jasmine and I get to take Jasmine's mom to experience her first ever time in Yosemite. Wow. So it's going to be epic. I'm so excited. Um, I'm excited for the opportunity just to like get some rest and relaxation in. Um, but that's really the the celebration, like I'm, my birthday is sort of, uh, uh, you know, secondary sort of to, to that. Um, so any, any sort of celebratory things will be happening up there, I guess. Wow. That sounds amazing. That sounds really amazing. And that's actually a great segue into this great, uh, question slash comment we got from Kelsey. Oh uh, yes. This, this, oh, uh, yes. yeah, this, this week. Um, do you want to sort of summarize what she shared with us? Yeah, I mean, she essentially heard what we were talking about two episodes ago with regards to, um, you know, assimilating back into, you know, sort of city life after being in nature. She started getting into hiking and stuff very similar to um, my story and then what you were talking about, Trevor, with the the lake in Virginia. Vermont. Um, she's, Vermont yeah. Sorry, Vermont. Vermont. Yeah. Uh, she started getting into, you know, hiking and, and, and camping and all this stuff and found it m increasingly challenging to come back to, um, civilization, to come back to city life. And her and her fiance actually moved to, um, the San Gabriel, San Gabriel Valley, which in, um, in Los Angeles is, uh, pretty far away from, you know, a lot of the hustle and bustle, but more importantly, it's in the foothills of the San Gabriel mountains. And, uh, I love going hiking in those mountains. They're gorgeous. And I can understand making that kind of choice in order to sort of support oneself with this grappling of, of, you know, city life versus, versus nature. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it was just really interesting. She, she said that, you know, she was really identifying with the, what you and I were talking about with regards to like doing enough with an acting career to kind of keep it afloat or, you know, doing things that sort of made us happy and made us money to live where we live. But at the same time, always thinking about, okay, when's the next trip? When's the next hike? When's the next time I can get outside? When's the next time I can get into nature? Um, and potentially considering, um, moving even further away from the city. I, I don't know if it's a function of just nature or just getting older, like we talked about two weeks ago, but you know, the idea, like I get it, I get why people, you know, it's not about giving up. It's about like a quality of life thing. And people go, you know what, I'm just going to go live in Idaho because, you know, I can own like a mansion for what I'm paying in rent on a one bedroom apartment in New York or L.A. You know what I mean? Um, so like I get it. I understand. I'm beginning to understand that choice. Um, I don't think I understood it as much um, when I was younger. Um, so anyway, I don't know if I did a very good job of summarizing all of it. You know, it was a, it was a longer email, but but I emailed Kelsey back and was like, this is my personal email. Let's go hiking. <laughs> like, yeah. So um, what, what, what came up for you in, in reading this? I mean, you know, this was a reaction to something that we discussed, but did it open anything up for you or did it make you think, 
differently in any kind of way about our conversation from two weeks ago? Oh, man, it 100 percent resonated. And you said something a few weeks ago uh, that that I also have been sort of uh, slowly educating myself on, which is this idea of highly sensitive people. <clears throat> These, this mm. idea that there are certain people that are just sort of more sensitive to noise and light and activity and um, things like that. And Kelsey says in her email here, she says, city life makes me uncomfortable. People in crowds and noise bother me. Um, and that she doesn't, like, like you said, she doesn't know if it's uh, just her getting older or, or just sort of developing a sensitivity to stuff. But but that that conflict between really craving a, a closer relationship with the sort of quiet, stoic qualities of the natural world and reconciling that with what's required by this industry, which is just being in the hustle and bustle of go, you know, running around the city, going to auditions, surrounded by concrete, always on a schedule, always being you know, tuned into your phone and your messages, looking for these last minute you know, opportunities. I really resonate with the conflict there. And uh, the older I get, the the more just good old fashioned happiness is really important to me. Uh, the hmm. chase is not as as thrilling to me as it used to be. I am much more uh, interested in just living a happy life on this planet. I'm just more and more in touch with my mortality every day and what's important. And uh, I'm, I'm like less willing to like make sacrifices for things that I just frankly don't enjoy because I don't get this time back, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. so it's like, I, I, yeah, I, 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 this was part of my sort of shift, you know, taking my foot off the gas pedal of, of an acting career. Cause I was just like, I don't like going on auditions I, when I get like nothing about this, this process is redeeming to me anymore, but I, my life feels much, uh, calmer and simpler and happier and gentler without the constant uh, um, demand of the possibility of an audition popping up at the last minute that I would have to sort of struggle, you know, um, um, you know, freak out about and get my shift covered at work and like, you know, drive across town for and hopefully not be late for. And then I, 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 I 100% resonate with what Kelsey's sharing. And I, I've always felt in the back of my head that perhaps there was a personality discord inside of me that made me not suited for this industry because of that. So I just, I wrote back to her as well. And I said, it's really good to know I'm not alone. We're not alone. Um, mm. And I don't know what the answer is to this. I do know of some people who, you know, have a, you know, a place up in like, you know, Mendocino or wine country somewhere. And they, commute to LA for auditions, but most of the time they live their life in this sort of idyllic countryside environment that really fuels them and, and contributes to their happiness. I don't know how feasible that is for an actor still trying to build their career. So I wonder if it's a choice or just a constant dance we have to be doing. Does that make sense? It, to it makes complete sense because, you know, there could be a day where I feel this way, the way that you're describing, and another day where I feel not necessarily like, like um, I'm I'm in you know 100% hustle mode, but rather that as a storyteller and an artist and an actor, I want to be in. I want to give myself the best opportunity I possibly can to to live a life where I'm doing that. And you know that's that that I I don't know. I think I think it's um. I think it could be a dance. I think it could be a choice. I think that people have done both, you know, people have, you know, danced with, with it. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be acting in, in, in nature. It could be acting in anything, um, or art and anything else, hmm. <clears throat> you know, that, that dance, uh, or it could be like, I'm just going to make a choice. So I don't have to do the, 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 the jig anymore. Yeah. You know? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't think there is a, a a right answer. I think there's just an uh, an answer that feels right. Yeah, you know, one thing that she says in her email is, every time I go away to nature, even for a day hike or a week trip, coming back to the real world actually feels like I'm going away from the real world, and that really uh, strikes a chord with me as well. And I think it's just about awareness and mindfulness and. I wish life was cut and dry. You know, I wish it was like, oh, yeah, here's the obvious thing. And so often it's more of a judgment call and you have to just let time be the judge of whether or not that was the, the wisest choice in the moment. 
Um, but I think it's amazing that we can celebrate that we're all aware of this. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it, sometimes we get caught up in like the, oh gosh, I don't know what to do. But like we forget to celebrate that. Oh my God, I have this awareness. This is great. Imagine if I was just lost in a fog of, uh, of, of feeling unsettled for, for whatever reason that I couldn't define. So there's that, you know, we, we can identify that there's this and we can start to build as much of that into our life as possible. Uh, as much of the good stuff, you know, in our life as possible. This good stuff, meaning the stuff that energizes us. Yeah. Uh, you know, Hey, ongoing conversation and Kelsey, thank you so much for this message. This is, uh, perfect. And I would really, really love to hear from other people, uh, who are listening or in the community. I would love to hear what their take on this is as well. And I think I might've mentioned this in a previous episode, but it's been my experience that as, as you get older, there's this sort of saying that you appreciate nature and the arts more as you get older, just naturally. And I'm finding that to be very true. So I'm, I'm curious if this is a simply a product of us aging and becoming more mature, or is this uh, a sort of endemic of a larger cultural shift toward uh, towards a, a different value set? I, I often wonder, you know, is it is it just me going along the natural process of of aging, or is it uh, am I part of a movement that's happening? Hmm. I'm curious. So yeah. I mean, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that. It, it's tough to know because you know the internet's an amazing place where you know if you google something or youtube something all of a sudden it feels like everybody's doing this yeah yeah <laughs> every, right every, everybody's doing a van conversion and doing hashtag van life <laughs> everyone <laughs> so many people and it's, they're making money on youtube and i could do that it's so easy to convince yourself that the world is doing fill in the blank just by searching the internet for it yeah exactly yeah. and there's a I'm scientific saying, study to back they back up everything yeah yeah of course of course <laughs> oh man all right well uh because this is such a deep rabbit hole, I'm going to end this right now um, so we can move into the interview. Um, Chip was awesome. So fun, funny, nice to talk to, um, has some great things to say. And uh, we hope you guys take away um, some tips, not only uh, Chip's money tips, but also on the uh, the acting career side of things. This first part um, is more focused on the acting. Second part focuses more on the uh, on the personal finance stuff, but all of it good content so enjoy this guys and we'll catch you on the other side Trev and AJ here with Chip Chinnery, who's a working actor. He's got several dozen co-star roles, uh, an Emmy award-winning stand-up comedian as well. And he's uh, he's even got his own CD and a notable stint on The Last Comic Standing. And he's also a redhead. So we have a lot of things to, to talk about with Chip today. <laughs> Chip, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, guys. So you come highly recommended from a recent guest of ours named Katie Von Till. She ah. sang your praises up and down uh, about your money blog. Specifically, you, you run a money blog called Chip's Money Tips. Thank and, you, yes. Uh, I had the, the joy of sort of poking through it for a while, and, and there's some really cool stuff on there. A lot of really fun little like money hacks and tips and tricks and things like that. Especially like like there's like tax loopholes and travel hacking and how to you know leverage the credit card rewards point systems and all that. So we'd love to touch on that as well. Uh, uh, but before we get to all of that, um, your your name is actually Chip Chinnery. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a chip off the old block. I'm a junior. So uh, Lawrence Adams Chinnery Jr. is my legal name, but I've been Chip since birth. And uh, that's where they got that nickname. And people assume that I, my folks were just Mary Poppins fans because of the, of the Chim Chimney song. But as it turns out, I looked it up. I was born eight days before the movie premiered in los angeles and eight months before the song hit the top 10 so my folks said they didn't know about it and uh it turns out they're right and uh you you didn't start here in los angeles you're in los angeles i believe right yes 
I've been living here since 94. Oh, 94. Wow. Okay. So you've been here a, a nice long while. But you started, uh, I think, in Cincinnati when, correct me if I'm wrong, when Jerry Springer was the mayor. Yes, I grew up in Cincinnati, and Jerry, uh, Jerry, he was uh, he was a uh, the boy mayor. They called him. He was mayor in the early seventies. He was a council member, and then mayor, and then he was so he had a little scandal. I don't know if you are all aware of it, but he, evidently he paid a lady of the evening with a check, and she went to the bank to cash it, and somebody saw the name on the check, and they're like, "That's a councilman." And uh, as reporters tend to be, sometimes they say they came at him with the "I got gotcha you" thing, you know, and they're like, "You you paid a hooker with a check," and they expected him to deny it, and he's like, "Ah, oh, yeah, I did." And they're like, what? <laughs> so all the, the so then people are like, wait a minute. If this guy won't lie about that, he's not going to lie to us about some, you know, political something or another. So he became very popular as a councilman, and be and in Cincinnati, if you get the most votes at the time, if you got the most votes as the councilman, you became the mayor. And so he was mayor for a while in my youth. Wow. So so Donald Trump is doing it all wrong, is what you're saying? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess he was Trump before Trump in a way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then okay. he, and Jerry went on to be a, a newscaster and won awards. And he, actually, when I started doing stand up in the late 80s out of Cincinnati, uh, Jerry uh, had a show, the Jerry Springer show. They started shooting it. And uh, someone from the show actually called me up and said, Hey, you're a comedian. We're thinking about doing a show about uh, lesbians. And like, we want you to be the guy who was out there and says, Hey, you guys are lesbians because you've never been with a guy like me. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. I can't do that. But another comedian friend of mine actually did it and had a fun time with it. So this was back – it was kind of like before people admitted that wrestling was uh, entertainment and not really a sport. They used to pretend that these were real people and real stories and they didn't have plants in these shows. But oh, that, that was Jerry and uh, he had a show and then it took off from there and became the, the big hit that it was. Chip, were those, were those popular acting gigs at the time? Like, did would 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 an agent or uh, somebody send you out on some you or an actor friend of yours out on those, or would you see them in the whatever the breakdowns were at the time? Would you see like we need somebody to come in and impersonate a, <laughs> such and such a thing on a talk show? You know, I I actually had not. This was a, a one time thing for me to experience, but. Uh... I think producers, that's part of the, I think that's part of their job. We got to have, we got to have a show. We got to get people. And sometimes they'd have real people and sometimes they wouldn't like in this case. But, uh, I, I didn't know, know of it as a way to act. I didn't know that that was a thing, but, uh, that was my only experience with that. It's so bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Chip, were you, you I, I read on your website that you, uh, were the radio host of a comedy show. You've also been a TV cameraman and a banker. Uh, so, <laughs> so you've done a lot of different things besides acting. When, when did the acting thing really take hold for you? Well, I, I came from stand up and, uh, my stand up career started when I was 16 in Cincinnati and I did open mics the summer before my, uh, senior year in high school. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say it's somewhere before my senior year in high school. I started doing stand up at open mics. I was 16, turned 17. And then I kind of did a, I kind of did that that summer and then did a, a, a couple, three shows a year until out of college. And then I got back into stand up in 86, 87 and did the open mics again and got worked up to the point where I could start touring. And then I didn't get into acting until like 93. I took some class at Second City in Chicago, and then I said, I'm moving to L.A., and then moved out here in 94 and started taking acting classes and got an agent, started auditioning, and it was 160 auditions before I got my first gig. So it took about three and a half years, and that was a commercial. 160. <laughs> did you did you track them somehow? Oh, yes. I'm I'm that guy. I write down. <laughs> I could tell you every date and what I did that date. I have my little file for my agent and all the casting directors and how many times I've been into them and what date I was in and what I auditioned for. Yeah, I'm that guy. That's awesome. I actually would love to talk more about that. And, and Katie Von Till, when we talked to her, she was she shared her sort of very meticulous spreadsheet and tracking as well. So I think that there's really something to that, given that, that both of you guys do it and have enjoyed uh, some fruitful careers. So uh, I'm curious, before we get to that, though, what was it about stand-up that really spoke to you? Well, I guess 
ah, geez, I, I don't want to sound like every other story, but I was always a funny kid, always into it. I was into impressions. I liked, I liked watching the comedians on The Tonight Show. I just – that was something I was just drawn to. And, I, you know, you look back and you go, well, not everyone stays up till 1230 to watch the stand-up comic on The Tonight Show. You know, it just was – it was just something I was into. And so when uh, I was 13, I started writing down jokes, ideas for jokes in a little legal pad. And, you know, no one else does that. So it's just something that I was just drawn to. Like I'm sure someone's drawn to playing a musical instrument that – or, you know, just drawn to whatever. You know, uh, so some kids have a chemistry set and they like to do things with that. I just was drawn to stand-up comedy and just comedy in general. And um, then I, I, I wrote down jokes when I was 13 and – Finally, when I was 16, got on stage. Wow. And then the acting thing really just kind of grew uh, very naturally and organically out of that. Yeah, because you, you look back and you see how stand-ups have always appeared in movies and TV shows. You know, it, just, uh, it was just a natural offshoot, whether they were very good at it or not. So, so then <laughs> the, you, you got involved with Second City, and I, I believe it with a, with a national tour of some kind out of Chicago. Well, I, Is that right? That's uh, – there was – Two, 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 two things. One, in college, I won a contest, a stand-up contest, and the prize was I got to improvise with the Second City National Touring Company, which was coming through the college town. So it sounds bigger than it was. It was just uh, I got to perform with them during an intermission, which I'm sure they were thrilled to have some amateur <laughs> college student jump on stage with them and they, oh, geez, not another one of these guys. But it was a highlight for me. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So what was the um, what was the tipping point for you when you were like, that's it, I'm moving to L.A., I'm going for the big leagues? Yeah, I had been uh, – I let's see. So I started doing stand-up again, my second coming of stand-up. You know, I did it when I was a teenager, did a few uh, shows throughout college. But in 87, I said, I, I can do this for a living now. People are out there doing it, and I want to do this. And I was working at a TV station doing open mic nights once a week in town. And uh, I was like, I got to I got to do it. I was offered another job in Connecticut and I can, And part of my deal of going to Connecticut was can I still do open mics? And they had one in the town next next door over. And I kept doing stand up. What was the question, Trevor? I <laughs> run, off, run off into my own brain. What drew me to acting? That's what it was. Yeah. Well, and, and also L.A. I mean, I mean, uh, a lot of people are very you know content to sort of hang out in their region and m their market and just sort of play in that world. But you were like, I'm going to L.A. I'm going to the Super Bowl. Yeah. So I had I'd been touring 50 weeks a year for five and a half years, I think it was. So in 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93. And by 93, I was just. You know, your career starts off and you're like, hey, this is awesome. I'm in a new town every week and I eat out every meal. And then after a while, you're like, I'm in a new town every week and I eat out every meal. <laughs> and it just is hell. It's it's not fun. Traveling's not fun. And living out of a suitcase gets old. And, oh, it's your fifth time back to this town. And it's like, well, it's a nice town, but I got to – this is not – I'm not going to do this for the rest of my life. I need to get to the next level. And for me, I felt that I was not going to be – uh, a stand-up comic who broke and became a huge hit uh, just off of your stand-up. So I moved to L.A. thinking I need to get on TV. I want to get on TV. And that's where they make TV. So I brought out, you know, moved out, got myself an apartment with a buddy of mine from college. We had a two-bedroom, two-bath apartment in the Cahuenga Pass, $700. We split it. So it was three fifty a month. Yes. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? It was yeah. like a 700 square foot apartment, small but perfect, you know. And uh, he he became a cop, and uh, it was great. So we had different hours, and just it was it was a great situation. And um, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be a guy on TV being funny. Wow. And how old were you when you made the made the move? Twenty nine. Twenty nine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So so old by today's standards, uh, as yeah, far as getting started so. in the industry. Well, I moved, yeah, so I had been doing stand-up full-time since I was 24, and uh, I, I dug out of debt. I went did a little deficit spending at the beginning. I got into debt doing the, the road, and then as I progressed up the ladder from opening act to feature act to headliner, I made more money, paid off my debt, and then started saving money and moved out to Los Angeles with a, a nice war chest of uh, $20,000. I'm, I'm bragging. But in reality, it was because I had uh, – I lived at my parents' house, 
and I saved, if I paid $300 a month rent, I think that worked out to about 20 grand that I saved over the time I was there. So it was directly uh, because I didn't have to pay rent. You know, I would be out of town so much and just pop in and get my mail. Have you always, have you always been so sort of personally financially responsible or was this a skill set that you felt you had to acquire? I, I've been weird about money forever. So it's been a weird thing. My dad was a salesman. My mom was a number cruncher. So I, that's something I just was attracted to too. I was like, well, what's this? And I liked commerce. I, my dad was a salesman. I thought it was cool. You know, you buy and sell things. Um, I was into baseball cards. That was a big passion of mine as a kid. And I even put on a baseball card convention when I was 16. It was that same, it was the fall just after I started doing stand up. So it was a big, 1981 was a big year, <laughs> but I had a, a baseball card convention. I used to buy and sell baseball cards and I, I just like commerce. I think it's interesting for some reason. Wow. And I bet that served you well getting started uh, in LA as an actor, having those, that skill set and that, that consciousness. Yeah, I just uh, it's I'm I'm lucky because of it. Uh, it just I, I but I've always been a guy who's like, well, I'll go eat a sandwich at Subway instead of going to the fancy restaurant, and that doesn't work out so well when you you offer that as an option on a date. Really, I, mean, I remember one girlfriend was like, let's go to lunch. I go, yeah, let's go to Subway. She's like, what? Just laughing at me, like, oh, uh, what? I don't know. Hey, you know, calories are calories, right? You know. <laughs> It's a sandwich. They make a nice sandwich over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I feel like with that experience, though, Chip, you might be one of the only stand-ups in history that that made money, paid off your debt, had a war chest of twenty thousand dollars before coming to Los Angeles. Like, I feel like most stories are, you know, if a stand-up makes any money, it's in the acting world. Like, it's yeah. it's, it's almost a, a joke in and of itself that you that you made money as a stand-up. <laughs> that's that's not exactly uh, you know the typical stand-up yeah. story. It's true. And I remember one guy I knew I worked with on the road. He called me up one day. He said, "Hey man, I decided I'm moving to L.A. I've got 800 bucks, and I'm like, it's now or never. And I'm like, wow, you have 800 dollars. You don't have any money, but that's me. Most people don't have money, so I should just. You know, you're right. I was very fortunate. It, it has served me well. I didn't have to do things I didn't want, you know. Yeah, well, on that note, uh, tell us about your first few months or years in L.A. I mean, you had this war chest. You had a, a, a you know, a nice sort of performance skill set built up, and you said you were meticulously tracking your career. So what was it like those first few years before things started to really fire on all cylinders? Well, I had um, – the first thing was I got to town, and, and I wanted to find an agent or manager, and that that was tough initially. Uh, it just you. I felt that you needed one. Everybody seems to think, oh, if you get the breakdowns, it'll be easy street. Well, you know, it's, you have to. Uh, what should I say? You need absolutely need need a commercial agent. You might be able to get away a little bit without a theatrical one. But I, I started taking acting classes, and ultimately, my first TV show became uh, it was Third Rock from the Sun, and I got on that because. Um, the casting director at the time, Gail Pillsbury, came to my acting teacher's class, Cecily Adams. Uh, Cecily since passed away, but uh, she had this class, and she'd have casting directors come in for now and then, and that's what happened. So that was a nice break. Uh, so you booked, that, you booked that job without representation? I booked it without representation, so it could be done. <laughs> You're the one. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> Also, I, I, it's the theatricals. I know you guys may feel the same way. Theatrical is a tough nut. I, I feel I've always felt uh, compassion for a, or empathy for a, a theatrical agent because there's fewer opportunities and there's not a ton of money. So uh, they weren't getting rich. If if I had an agent, they weren't going to get rich off my co-star on Third Rock from the Sun. But it was a thrilling time for me to actually. Here I was, 20 years later. Or I, let me think 20 years later. I was 30-something when I finally got on that show. And here I was on a network show saying lines, working with Jane Curtin from Saturday Night Live and John Lithgow. It was the big time. Yeah. Now, did you have to have a, 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 a we call them thrival jobs, uh, you know, a survival job, a day job? Did you have to have anything like that uh, in those early years to make ends meet? Or were you able to well, support yourself? Well, mine was the stand-up. Yeah, I still did stand-up. I would uh, – 
my plan for the first three years I was out here, 94, 95, 96, I'd stay for pilot season. Then I'd book myself out for a couple months. Then I'd come back for a couple months. Then I'd book myself out again. And then around October, November, I'd head back across the country doing gigs across the country to be home at Christmas time in Cincinnati. And then I'd head back across the country again. So I was cutting back from 50 weeks a year to about 35, and I thought I was doing a tremendous amount of cutting back. But when I finally got an agent, he's like, I thought you were going to be in town. I go, I got to go make my money. So that was my survival job was just reloading the bank account, driving out across the country or going out for a month or two. And uh, I did have one situation where I was – I driven. it was my deal where I had to drive across the country – and because I had auditions, it was November, and I, in 48 hours, I drove from here to Mankato, Minnesota, and that was a lot of driving, and I just should have planned it better. But anyway, I went to Minnesota, started doing a couple uh, gigs, and then I got a call from my agent that I had, a callback for this AT&T spot that I just went on. And I was like, you know what? I have not booked the commercial yet at this time, and I was like, I think I can get it. And so I – asked the club if I could leave for a night and I jumped on a plane, used my frequent flyer miles that I'd banked and I flew across the country got up in the morning did the callback, flew back to Minnesota and then I found out that I was their second choice mm. ah, so close mm. but I was getting so close that I could taste it and, and in my mind it was like if you do a commercial you can make twenty or $30,000 and I won't have to go on the road you know I can cut back all those weeks on the road just because then I would have made money doing a commercial. So my survival job, just long, long answer is that I would go out on the road doing stand up and just collect those dollars. Chip, how would you, how would you book those gigs? Was it just from uh, having known those, those club owners and stuff from when you were out on the road before? Would you, I mean, in other words, were you sort of self managing your, your stand up career? Yeah. Most of the comics at the time, and I, I don't know what they're doing today, but at the time, comics would just book themselves, and there were certain bookers who booked a bunch of clubs, and you'd get in with them, and mm. there were other other clubs that just booked their own club, so they would just have their one club. So uh, in the early stages of doing stand-up, I, I went on tour, and you know I did one night popping in to do a guest set for this booker and guest set for that booker, and then they'd say, oh, we like you, and then they would give you weeks of work. So initially, I was my own agent manager, and I – always was with stand-up uh, and most of the guys were some guys oh they're for, they're with omnipop agency out of california or new york and so those guys would have an agent book their stand-up for them but for the most part guys on the road grinding it out like me were booking it on their own we we i think we had somebody from omnipop on the show like nine years ago yeah bruce <laughs> still bruce around. smith <clears throat> bruce smith yeah yeah, yeah he's yes. uh, He's the guy. He's the West Coast guy. Yeah. He was on the show. He's like in the first, like, I don't know, few, like the first dozen episodes or so. Was in. Uh-huh. Anyway, uh, that's that's crazy. He's a good guy. So all, all this this tracking, uh, did you have a spreadsheet or a, a journal or how did you manage your, your career? Uh, I mean, just, just the fact that you knew exactly when, where, you know, uh, the when and the where and the, the how and the who of your auditions and whatnot. Um, this is a skill that you've obviously cultivated and developed over the years. How, how, what exactly do you track and how, how does it continue to serve you? Well, yeah, initially, I, when I was doing stand-up, I, I started keeping track in a just a binder. And everybody, you know, I'd have little dividers for each different booker. And I'd flip to that page and see when I talked to them last and when do they say I need to call them back. This, And then I'd mark it in my calendar. So then I would just kind of refer to the binder when I called them. And then computers came around and the laptop. And uh, I got a laptop with Shetta. I, I opted for the bigger one. I got the 80, 80 megabit hard drive. 80 megabytes. That was my hard drive on my laptop. And uh, <laughs> that's uh, wow. Yeah, I upgraded from the 60 to the 80. I figured I needed the extra space. But it was my laptop. And on there, I, I had um, uh, I started doing the comedy club bookers. I had uh, every booker had a page. And then when I just when I moved to Los Angeles, I was like, well, I got to keep track of acting, too, don't I? So I have a page for my my uh commercial agent and my tv 
agent and that's the master page i guess you'd say so but i go on an audition like uh i went on today i will go to my commercial agent and i will go to the uh, make an entry for this date and which casting director and what job and when the callback is and when it shoots and what i wore and uh, then i will also take that same entry and put it on the page for the casting director and then i keep a running total of how many auditions i've been on for that casting director or all time which why don't i just tell you that now that might be fun (laughs) you know that's that's very reminiscent of a performer track we had brian vermeer on a a few times Uh Um, are you familiar with brian the performer track no, but I did say it like I did, didn't I? I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, Sorry, Brian, I'm he, not aware of it, but he yeah, tell he, me he built a, a a great little, I guess, product that's turned into a service. It's now like a subscription service, but it's a very uh, comprehensive and thorough way to sort of track your career, and basically has everything that you just mentioned, as well as some fun like you know mileage tools and, and things like that built in. Um, but it seems like the the people who are con- enjoying consistent success in this career are also uh, notorious trackers of the details and things like that. Chip, are you just, are you just using Excel for this, or you know, this is a, I'm sure Brian's thing is much better than my system, <laughs> and all I'm using, I mean, mine's barely better than a notepad. It's uh, just I use Microsoft Word, and uh, and I just have a file, and I just uh, every audition I I change the number from seven to eight, and then eight to nine. That's how many I've been on. You know, like it's like I look at. I've been on seven auditions for my commercials this year. I've been on seven auditions, two callbacks, no avails, no booked. Boo. But uh, in my career, you're probably saying, Chip, how many have you been on your career? Well, I will tell you, through 2017, I've been on 1,879 auditions, 503 callbacks, 175 avails, and 74 bookings. That is a really cool – it's really cool to have that information available oh my God. to you. It also no, helps. seriously, the, the percentages there, like – It'd be so uh, fascinating to to get those. I mean, I'm really glad you said those numbers because, you know, sometimes people get disheartened after a th- you know well, who wouldn't after 500 auditions. You're like, I haven't booked a thing, but like, you're talking thousands and thousands of auditions and 74 bookings. Like, yeah, it's almost it's almost inspiring. Almost. Yeah, it's uh, and also what I like about it is like I I also have these running totals for. You know, like I'll, I'll have, you know, I have this in here since uh, 1994. And so I can see each year how many auditions I had. And when I was the king of commercials from 97 to uh, 2001, I mean, it was, I was getting at my peak auditions. I had 140 in a year and I had 44 callbacks, 21 avails, and I booked 10 of them. That was 97. And, uh, wow. And actually, yeah. So, so you have it broken down by by you have it broken down by industry or slash agent representation. You have it broken down by casting director, and then you have it broken down by time, like chronology, what year it was, and all well, that. I have, Is that I have the running total, yeah, and my and I keep that on the same page as my agency. And actually, I misspoke about ninety seven. I I had two different agents at the time, so I had a uh, hundred and seventy. Anyway, it's a lot of auditions. It's a lot yeah. of auditions, and it's a lot of thank you, goodbye. <laughs> uh, and so what I'm saying too is like by seeing all this, is like, oh, in my heyday, I was going out a ton. Now I also know in the past six years, it dropped off, the, it dropped off a cliff in 2000. It went from a, in 2006, I had 110. Then it went to 93 auditions in 2007, and then 2008 became 59. And it was 59, 61, 59, 60. 49, 40, 41, and 36 in the years that followed. So uh, commercials in 2008 took a turn for me. I don't know what happened in the industry or if what happened to me. Did I suddenly change categories? Was I uh, – I didn't have a lot of uh, commercial conflicts at the time. So I was like, what's going on? Why is it, uh, why is it so slow? No, I think something, something did happen. I mean 2008 – that, well, I mean, first of all, that was the financial crash. Right. Yeah, that's true. that's one. And then I, I feel like we just had Kevin E. West on again for the second time, and I remember him talking about something to do with the commercial contracts. Oh, and okay, I yeah. think it was around that time. I think he said it was like ten years ago. So okay. 
there could have been, and you know, it's uh-huh. funny, you, you never know where the effect is coming from, right? But I think, I think it was around to, I have to go back and listen to our own episode, Trev, to oh, like cool. remind myself what that, what that was, but I'm pretty sure it was around that time. Oh, interesting. Almost all my friends who are booking commercials today are booking non-union commercials. So I, I do think that there was something with the contracts that shifted. And if you're union, I think you kind of got the short end of the stick when it came to the commercial world starting. Around, yeah, around it there. has it has faded. And my agent said that about half the stuff they get is non-union these days. And I'm like, well, I just don't want to do that. So I don't thankfully I don't have to. You know, I, I'm fine. I don't need to do it to eat. So I'm like, eh, I'm going to not do it. So what what I'm curious what um consistencies or through lines or themes you started that you you started to see emerging as you were tracking your auditions was it, whether was there a certain shirt or a certain uh attitude that you went in that you started to go oh this usually works well for me uh I would try uh, for the 3 years I wasn't booking I steadily felt myself getting closer and closer to doing it and I always tried to give a little bit I like a tag, a little line, a little improvement, a little something, because ultimately they would like a little something from you. So if you're doing a commercial, I'd like to do that. I don't do that as much with a TV show, although I just had a casting director say, oh, yeah, you can always tag it, always tag the scene. I'm like, I was taught by my cast, by my casting director, uh, actor, friend who had a class to never tag it because – when you're at a callback, you're going to be in there with the guys who wrote it, and they've been up till two in the two in the morning doing this, and they really don't look ki- kindly upon a an actor coming in there and improving their script. So I always stayed away from it. But then most recently, this other casting director said, "Yeah, always tag your scene." So I don't know if the rule has changed there as well, but I I tread lightly. But to answer your question, did I see something that I was doing that? Uh, was getting me closer to booking it, uh, just trying to be more myself and be confident and go in there and give them what I think the commercial should be. Hmm. Hmm. Now, I, I've been out of the commercial world for a long time, so uh, I'm, I have to admit I'm unfamiliar with the term tagging the scene. What, what does that okay. mean? Okay, just adding a tagline, tagging, the, uh, putting it, putting yeah, I guess maybe tag's not the best word, but uh, adding a line to it. They, they will sometimes refer to them as buttons. There you uh, go. In, Thank uh, you. That's a bit. Yeah. I mean, it's the same, it's the same concept. Um, and it's funny, in, the other day, <clears throat> in an audition, a commercial audition, we got to the end of the scene, and the the guy who was running the session kept the camera rolling at the end. And like, it got really awkward, and then he, he stopped the camera, and he goes, oh, you son of a bitch, I thought you were going to put a button on there. <laughs> like, he was, he kept the camera rolling, expecting me to do that funny whatever thing it was, and I was like, oh, well, there was a missed opportunity, and of course, I didn't book that one, but it, yeah. it, it's funny, I'm glad you're bringing this up, Chip, because it, it makes me want to play around. I feel like in commercials, it's a little more, I don't know, I'm with you, I don't know if I would do it theatrically, but I feel like commercially, um, you know, there's a lot more... They want you to, you know, they want to steal your your uh, your line and give it yeah. to the actor that they actually hire. But, you know, uh, it seems to happen a lot more in commer- commercials. In my yeah, experience. I would definitely tag or I'm sorry, do a button or just improvise during a commercial audition. They're not going to get upset. And and then they, they may see that as like, oh, this guy has ideas. We should hire him because he's full of ideas. Uh, that I think is a good way to express yourself. I don't. I've been in auditions, and maybe you guys have as well. Where I I was in one, and this woman couldn't stop running off at the mouth. And I think when she would go up to the table, and she tried to be so nice to the people in charge, and I just thought they are gonna not. They don't want to be in a room with you for eight hours. You know, I think that these ad agency people think about that. I I do anyway. I think present yourself like a normal human being. <laughs> And be someone who they're like, yeah, we could work with this guy. That's another thing I would say, a little tip, a little hint. Yeah, yeah, we, we talk about that a lot on the show. It's like you, you, we, there's another term we throw around every once in a while, and it's the term whacter. Like, you know, you've, <laughs> you, we've all met them. You know, they're people that are just overly eager to show you how great they're going to be to work with. And it, they end up oftentimes, I think, shooting themselves in the foot. So a big part of our job, I think, is just to show that we're professionals that are going to be totally cool for 14 hours on set from, you know, 4 a.m. to however long it goes. Hey, 
everybody. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed part one of our conversation with Chip. Any big takeaways for you, AJ, uh, from this conversation? It's, it's sort of like spoiler alert because a lot of my biggest takeaways were from the second part, so I don't want to necessarily get into that, but I really appreciated um, revisiting the, you know, it's funny, we're sitting here having this huge co- conversation about the dance between having an acting career and and, and not, or having an acting career and focusing on, on other things. And one of the most important things, if you want to have an acting career, is to have it be sustainable. And that's sort of, you know, what Chip has, has managed to do, regardless of whether he was booking or not. And he's super honest and vulnerable with us about, you know, when he wasn't. And, um, and he's been able to you know, uh, maintain a, a good life because he's been smart with his money when he has been making it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So that was appreciated. Yeah. I would love to sit down with him at some point, uh, in the future in whatever capacity and just talk to him about the psychology of, uh, of money management because in, in mm. our culture, you know, we, we touched on this really briefly in the interview, but you know, this whole thing about like, Oh, I've got to have this kind of jacket or this kind of car, or this expensive haircut or this kind of adornment, you know, fill in the blank to appear successful in this industry. It's important that I show up and people see success. When, if you take a peek under the hood of that person's life, they're like paycheck to paycheck, struggling to keep the lights on. And there's a great book called The The Millionaire Next Door. We may have mentioned it in this interview. I can't remember. But uh, it's a wide-ranging study, decades and decades of uh, of following different families all over the country. And they found that the wealthiest families typically were driving like a beat-up old Ford Taurus or making like 75 grand a year tops, you know, doing some sort of blue-collar work. But they were so good at managing their money. And the people that were poorest were the dentists and the surgeons with $800,000 in income every year and boats and things like that. But they had virtually no worth, when it, no net worth when it came to you know accumulating wealth. Uh, they were just like spending it on everything. So it was, it was a really interesting book. And I would love to dig into that with, with Chip at some point. But uh, if you guys are interested in, in this kind of thing, you're going to love part two. And, uh, and check out that book. It's, it's quite an eye opener. That, that sort of ties into our previous conversation as well, because, you know, one thing that I would encourage anybody to do is responsibly, not irresponsibly, but responsibly spend money where it makes you happy. You know, you were talking about earlier, Trevor, about, you know, how happiness is like the most important, um, you know, commodity to you recently. And I have felt very similarly. And uh, I don't want to get into all the details, but I have spent, um, at this point, a sort of embarrassing amount of, of money on my backcountry backpacking, you know, setup, but it makes me so happy. Hmm. And I'm, I've invested so much more money in that in the last year than I have in say my acting career. And that's just something to notice and something I've been thinking a lot about lately. Hmm. I, I I love that. I just loved it. It's funny when you say it that way, like, oh, happiness is my prime, you know, directive. It's like, that's so simple and obvious and should, <laughs> should have been clarified from the start, you know, 15 years ago. And yet, when you really grasp that, when you really wrap your heart around that, it is life changing. Uh, and it's not about like, you know, not making sacrifices for things. It's just, it's just prioritizing things differently. You heard about that class at Yale, yeah? No, there's a there's a class at Yale that um, I forget they re- they they released it last semester or s- semester before last, and it became instantly became the most popular class in the history of the university. This is Yale. This is an Ivy League school. The his the the most popular class in the history of the university, and they recently I think released it somehow publicly and for free. So I got to dig in and figure out where this is and how to find it and, and, and consume it. But it was a class on happiness Hmm. and it was, it was the most popular. It's become the most popular class in the history of Yale university. Anyway, uh, it's all, uh, it's in the zeitgeist, man. There's something here. There's something here. I just need to, just need to grab it. (laughs) Or you're, you're just Googling too much. Right. One of the two. Or one, yeah, or, or like no one gives a shit about happiness, yeah. and I just happened to type happiness into the Google search bar. Anyway, 
What is your pick of the week, my uh, friend? So my pick of the week uh, is one of the best movies I've seen in a long time, A Quiet Place. Guys, if you haven't seen this movie, uh, if you don't even know what I'm talking about, just Google it right now or check out the link in the show notes on our website, aquietplacemovie.com. It is uh, John Krasinski, Emily Blunt. It's a monster in the house movie, but it is so beautifully constructed and shot. And uh, I mean, I my knee nails were digging into the seat cushion like the entire movie. It was awesome. I, I enjoyed it so thoroughly. And go see it in the theater because you need that big screen experience with it uh check it out a quiet place movie.com seriously do not hesitate to see this movie on the big screen in the theater as soon as you can it is such a ride i enjoyed the hell out of it and i have not been enjoying movies that much lately so i was surprised to be like wow mm. it was awesome check it out 10 out of 10 stars from from me for whatever nice it's yeah Trevor, I'll get stamp of approval. This has been on my list since the moment I saw the the first trailer. I saw as soon as I saw the first trailer, I was like, "That is a brilliant concept," and I cannot wait to see this movie. So um, I'm glad uh, uh, someone I know and trust enjoyed it, and um, I'm excited to get out there and, and check it out. Yeah, make it make it happen in the theater. Seriously, this is a movie to spend the 17 bucks to see in the theater. Absolutely, right on. Yeah, right on. Uh, and your pick of the week, which I love. I've been reading about this this week because we just had Earth Day, and Apple's uh, Apple's quite active in this. Uh, in this realm. Yeah. So we've, uh, so Apple has always done the recycling uh, thing where you can like trade in uh, an old device and get store credit to update, you know, upgrade to a new one. But a lot of people don't know that you can actually trade in sort of anything, even if it's not worth any money just to uh, environmentally responsibly recycle it. Um, so little known fact is you can go into any Apple store and um, in America, anyway, I don't know about the rest of the the, the world. I, I hope everyone's doing this, but every Apple store can sort of be used as an electronics recycling center. Within reason, you can't drag in like a 46-inch CRT monitor or something like that. Then um, There's like a tiny bucket in the back. <laughs> so old cell phones, you know, even flip phones, uh, old cell phones, even non Apple phones uh, can be recycled sometimes for credit as well. So like Samsung phones and stuff like that. Um, cables. I know a lot of people have like old Ethernet cables and 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 I don't know, uh, RCA cables and stuff just sort of lying around. That kind of stuff can all be recycled. You just bring it in. Um, but uh, recently they updated their uh, trade in uh, program and changed the name to Apple Give Back, which is my pick of the week. Um, this was on the heel. So it's during Earth Month. You know, we just had Earth Day the other day during Earth Month um, on the heels of the announcement that every single Apple facility in the world, every data center, every office, every retail store is now run on 100 percent renewable energy. Um, and they are working on doing the same thing with the suppliers. Um, all of the suppliers are now certified zero waste, but they are not all run on 100 percent renewable energy. So that's the next sort of step. Um, and uh, the. Give back program now allows you to recycle things um, uh, at any point. You used to have to be purchasing a new device in order to recycle your old one. So now you don't um, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, you just you can just bring it in and either you'll get credit for it or you won't. So until April 30th, um, the end of the month, uh, Apple will, in addition to um, taking in your recycling, they will in, um, donate um, part, they will do make a donation sort of on your behalf to um, um, the Con uh, Conservation International. Mm, so for right, every yeah. device they receive, they're making a, a donation to Conservation International. A question I want to ask you about this real quickly before we wrap up is about Greenpeace. I know Greenpeace uh, took some issue with Apple's uh, efforts in this area. Do you know much about that? Uh, I don't. I don't. What were they... What was the deal? I, I just saw that Greenpeace was somewhat critical of Apple's efforts. So in the wake of this announcement, Greenpeace came in and sort of rained on the party. And I, I like Greenpeace. I think they do important work. I just was curious as to what issues they actually took issue with. Um, uh, but okay. I mean, something to research, I guess. Uh, given that our connection is getting a little wonky and you've got a boogie, let's get out of here, shall we? 
I hope you can hear me. <laughs> uh, today's episode of Inside Acting was produced and hosted by me, Trevor Algott, and A.J. Meyer with production help from Jen Levin. Visit us online at InsideActing.net to sign up for our weekly email dispatch and listen to all of our episodes. We're also on social media and pretty much everywhere you can find your podcasts. You can directly support the continued production of Inside Acting with either a one-time financial contribution or an ongoing monthly contribution. Just visit us at InsideActing.net to learn more and help us keep this thing online for all to enjoy. And that's it for episode 310. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. And in the meantime, pursue happiness.